Junior choir is dismissed? All right, we'll try it that way. Anyway, if you would open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. And we will continue our series. And uh, I'm excited at the opportunities that I get to preach. And uh, please think to pray for Pastor Whitmer. He was preaching in West Virginia this morning, and he'll be preaching uh, in Maryland on Tuesday, I believe, to a fellowship of pastors in, uh, somewhere in Maryland. And so, uh, anyway, just think to pray for him as he's away. The Lord will give him safety. And uh, I know especially that pastors' fellowships can be a great time of encouragement, so pray that the Lord will use him to be an encouragement as he speaks to them, but also that he would come back encouraged and uh, excited about life. Not that he's not, but just more so. And uh, that would be great on all around everybody's behalf, I suppose. Uh, but First John chapter 4, and I have to tell you that I was actually um, very torn because it is, uh, you know, First John is a great book, and I'm really enjoying the, the meat that I'm pulling out of it in my studies of it. Um, but I was just overwhelmed with the, the study that I was doing for our youth group for Sunday school in uh, studying out the holiness of God and realizing what it is that we understand the Sunday school answer of the definition of holiness is that uh, God is set apart. And then we look at the realization that um, we are being sanctified or the process of becoming holy or being made set apart. And so uh, looking all that, it really uh, just the Lord has gripped a hold of my heart in being excited to study that out even more. And so with that on my mind, uh, you'll see some of that filtered into our message this evening. And uh, just excited about it. So let's just get into it. First John chapter 4 and verse 14. And the Bible says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the expression of your love that we see here in this passage. I pray that you would uh, make your thoughts clear to us this evening. Lord, challenge our hearts, conform us to the image of your Son, that in all things Christ would be exalted. And as we exalt him, that you would draw all men unto him even this evening. We'll give you the praise and the glory that you're worthy of. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God is love. You've heard that many times, often in an abused phrase, that the world says God is love. People manipulate this phrase to say God is love, and so therefore there can be no such thing as hell, a, a place of wrath and torment, that uh, a place of what they view as hatred. And so... Uh, this can't be if God is love. That's a contradiction in Scripture. And so they play that out and uh, often manipulate this phrase, but realize that in this passage we see His ultimate love demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. It says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God. Realize this is a, a contrasting phrase to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2, where it, it requires that any teachers, if you were to put them to the test of whether they are truly biblical teachers, whether they are of the Holy Spirit or not, the test is that they would declare that Jesus, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And so this contrast is saying that if you're truly a teacher of the Holy Spirit, you'll, you'll uh, explain that Jesus Christ truly is 100% God. 
The importance is bridging the gap on both sides that Jesus Christ came in the flesh to be a true kinsman redeemer. He satisfied all the requirements of a just God in being made flesh, in fulfilling all the commandments of the law, and therefore being the eligible lamb of the world, the lamb of God that would be slain to take away the sins of the world. And so he had to be made flesh, but realizing God's holiness that is the very necessity that a, an intercessory lamb would come to the world, that a substitute would be slain to, to bear the wrath of the punishment of our sin on himself because we are sinners at best, that we have already made ourselves not holy. We have already made ourselves not pure, and so therefore none of our righteousness would be pure in God's eyes, but it's all filthy rags in his eyes. So then, it was necessary that Christ would come in the flesh so that he could fulfill the law in the flesh, be a kinsman redeemer according to God's law, and then that he would be 100% God so that therefore he could be holy, pure. That he could be God's requirement to be that sacrifice. And so we find that this contrasting phrase to start it out points us in the right direction that in Christ's redeeming work, though love Makes the, makes the atonement, it is violated holiness that requires the atonement in the first place. And so, in the eternal punishment of the wicked, the demand of holiness for self-vindication overbears the pleading of love for the sufferers. And thus, we will observe the holiness of God. Allow me to time out for a moment to put this passage in a little bit broader perspective of the totality of Scripture, and bear with me, teenagers, as we work through some of the thoughts of this morning and, and replay that just a little bit to give the general audience an understanding of the things that we've seen. Because understanding the full holiness of God, which I'll make a feeble attempt to explain tonight, understanding the full holiness of God puts this passage and all of the plan of God's salvation in total perspective. The greatness of God's holiness what sets him apart, that makes him so unique, more than any creature that is made? What makes him a God to be reverenced in, uh, in all of, above all other gods? That there is none other like him in all the earth. No God has the capability of doing the things that our God has, is able to do. Because they are created beings. They have ears, but they don't hear us. They have eyes, but they don't see us. They have mouths, but there's no communication from them telling us what they expect of us or how we're to live. And so we go off of the imaginations of men to follow any other God. They have arms and hands that are made with the hands of feeble creation, and yet they have no ability to, to minister to us, no ability to provide for our needs. And so all other gods are mockery before a holy and just God. Before the creator of all the universe, all other gods fail in comparison. Shall we stoop to try to compare feeble man creation before the creator? How can we dare to speak of any such parallel of man before a holy God? And so tonight, I explain to you Webster's dictionary definition of holy. The word holy is exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. And in a moment, the words that I'm going to define here will all tie together and make sense. So bear with me on the preparatory work of tonight's message, and when we get into it, it'll be exciting. Webster's dictionary definition of the word righteous, acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. And then looking at Webster's uh, dictionary definition of the word justice, the maintenance or administration of what is just, especially by the partial, impartial adjustment of conflicting claims or the assignment of merited rewards or punishments. Why define those terms all together? How is this helping? How do righteousness and justice tie into holiness at all? Justice and righteousness are simply holiness exercised toward creatures. The righteousness of God is the imposing of righteous law and demands. This may be called legislative holiness. In this attribute, we have revealed God's love of holiness, which always leads him to do right and to demand that which is right. The justice of God is the execution of righteousness. The justice of God is the execution of the penalty attached to his laws. This may be called judicial holiness. In this attribute, we have revealed God's hatred of sin which 
devoid of all passion and caprice, always leads him to be just and to demand what is just. And so, because God is holy, because he is set apart, because he is pure, that he is without sin, that he can't even bear to look towards sin. And so because of all of that, he has shown his righteousness to us, which lays out the foundation of law, saying here are the boundaries of what is holy. And so therefore, if you violate these laws of righteousness, you are not considered holy. Therefore, you don't meet the satisfaction of a holy, just God. Because of that, God's righteousness, which causes him to love holiness, which causes him to love purity, which causes him to desire that which is right and good and just, because he is so in love with righteousness and purity, his justice demands that those things which are not righteous, those things which are not holy, be met with justice. And so therefore, if we are not holy, then we stand in fear of punishment for that. We stand to, to bear the wrath of a holy God because he is righteous and just. And so having said all of that, I want to call our attention to really the awesomeness of getting a, a, a view, a glimpse of God's holiness. When Moses sees God's holiness on Mount Sinai, what a tremendous display of God's greatness. God comes to Moses and tells him, look, I am going to uh, establish a law and so that the children of Israel don't just riot against you and say, this is just you making this up and that's not fair. We don't agree with these terms. So that they understand it, you call out all of the children of Israel from the camp, have them all stand at the foot of the mountain, and I want them to observe my display of coming down, that they will see my presence on the mountain. And so, as is the plan, they rope off, uh, they, they set a perimeter around the base of the mountain that nobody should be on the mountain, that no cattle, no livestock, nothing should be anywhere close to the foot of the mountain. Because if it were to be there, when the holiness of God comes down on that mountain, it will instantaneously die. And so, because of that, they have it all roped off, the children of Israel come out, and as they're there, God ascends on the mountain, like, descends on the mountain like a cloud. And so in the storm and the shaking of the mountain and the ground, it is an awesome display of God's power. At that moment, as all the children of Israel are afraid and terrified at God's display of power, I don't know what was going through Moses' mind as he's thinking, I'm going to go up into that mountain now. But Moses goes forward nonetheless. God says, I will be the God of the children of Israel if they will obey my law and do what is just, do what is righteous. So Moses goes back down out from the mountain and he says, God will be your God if you'll do what is right. And after seeing all of that, they are in awe of, of God. And so, of course, their response is instantaneously, we will obey him. We will do what he wants us to do. And so Moses goes back up into the mountain. And once again, God ascends in a cloud onto the mountain. And in uh, Exodus 34, you don't have to go there, but in verse 5 it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty." visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. As God passes before Moses in all of the display of the greatness of God, Moses does not stand and try to proclaim his own righteousness. He doesn't justify his presence on the mountain. He, he, rather than do anything else or have any other emotion, instantaneously, in verse 8, it says, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Instantly, he is humbled by the sight of the holiness of God. And so he falls immediately, as quickly as he possibly can hit the ground, he falls before him to worship him. Not only does he worship him, but then in verse 9, and he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Realize when Moses fell before God and he worshipped him because he saw that he was worthy to be worshipped, 
the very uh, sequential thought in his mind is, please have mercy on us. I realize that the way that our people are is not the way that you are. That is an awesome sight, and we are not that. Please be merciful to us. Be patient. Be long-suffering towards us. We are a stiff, stiff-necked people. We have done what is right in our own eyes. We constantly seek what pleases ourselves, and please be merciful to us. Please be our God. Despite the fact that we have said we will obey you, we are not obeying you to the, the level that you are worthy to be obeyed. Please be our God. And so he begs not only on behalf of himself, but on behalf of all the children of Israel. Your holiness is so amazing. I can see where that demands your justice. Please be merciful to us. So then too, we see in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, Isaiah sees the holiness of God and it demands a response in his heart. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And time out, let's take a moment here to explain the irony of the fact that King Uzziah died, that earthly kingdoms will come and go, that they, as powerful as a throne may be, it is weak and it is but a, a speck on the footstool of God on this earth. And so to note that King Uzziah died, Whatever turmoil may have came, come with the transition between kings, it didn't phase God at any point, but to realize that while King Uzziah died and somebody else would surely fill his throne, that God was still exalted on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train, the very display of his royalty, filled the temple. And so to note that God, not only in his purity, not only in his sinless perfection, but in every other facet of his being, he is exalted far set apart from anything that any in his creation would try to manipulate or try to imitate in their own creation. No matter how big of a throne you can make, your kingdom will never come close to matching that, which is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so to note that he is the King of kings, he is set apart on an exalted throne, but then, above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. Not even the angels that minister before his throne stand to, to bear their face uncovered before the holiness of God. They don't let any, any ounce of their flesh, any thread of flesh, stand before God. But yet, they cover it with wings because his holiness is too magnificent a sight to take in to even taint that in the slightest way, and so they cover themselves before him. With twain they did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. How magnificent to see the angels of heaven worshiping the holiness of God. The power of that moment explained in this very next phrase. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. How powerful a moment in every aspect of that moment. To see the holiness of God worshipped by his created angels. To see that such authority and, and force is proclaimed in it that the posts of the door shake in the house and that the house will be filled with smoke. What is Isaiah's response to it? Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I have learned that I don't fully understand the holiness of God. I don't have the slightest glimpse of what Moses and Isaiah saw in Scripture. If I saw the holiness of God as these men, these men have seen it, if I craved holiness as these men understood it to be, I would have that same distaste, that same hatred for sin, to think this, the enjoyment of this is nothing compared to seeing the holiness of God as the satisfaction in my heart. I personally cannot testify to saying I have arrived in this area. And so, 
it only made sense to me that as we look at the assurance of our salvation, lest it become mundane repetition in looking through the different uh, cycles of how, the different tests of how we know assurance of our salvation before a holy God, I thought it appropriate tonight that we would pause and just catch a glimpse of His holiness to really fully capture how great of a sacrifice His extension of salvation to us was, how unworthy we are before Him, and how great His love for us must be to still extend that love, to still, ex to still sacrifice His pure and holy Son, that He who knew no sin would take upon Himself the sin of all the world. How pitiful those lustful thoughts become when comparing it to the holiness of God. Those selfish and self-righteous thoughts. What a laughing stock the pride of our heart must be when we get a reality, a, a glimpse of God high and lifted up in His train filling the temple and we think that we're somebody before Him. What a joke that our righteousness would be as anything more than filthy rags before His throne. To realize when we see the justice of our holy God explained in Scripture, we understand that God's wrath was satisfied by Christ on the cross. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. It is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I love my daughter with all of my heart. To think that there would ever be a day that she would ever come to me, unless you think I don't love my son as much. She's the only one that cries out, Daddy, Daddy, right now. But as she comes to me and says, Daddy, Daddy, pick me up, hold me, that I would ever knowingly turn my back on her and walk away, that I would ever look at her with disdain, that I would ever think that you were ashamed to me, that I would ever think there would ever be one reason that I would not come to her very beckoning to meet any need that she ever had, to think that God who is love, the perfection of love, would ever see his son in a situation that he would look on him and the God who is love would turn his back on his son who has done nothing wrong because his son has borne on himself the sins of this world. All the other things, the, the reality of hell, the wrath of God being poured out on us, seems to fail in comparison to the fact that God would turn his back on his son because he hates sin so much that when sin was laid on his son, he even hated to look at his son. And it wasn't for any crime that his son had done, but it was because of our lying tongue, because of our shameful living, because of the wickedness and naughtiness of my heart. God turns his back on Jesus Christ. But to know that not only does he turn his back his back on his son, that he can't even bear to look at sin, but that God's wrath would be poured out on those who refuse Christ in Luke 13, 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall, say, when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Realize that while the world says it can't be the love of God that would create such a place as hell, I say to you, it is very true. It is the justice of God that demands that a place like hell be created not because of his anger and wrath towards man, but because he can't bear the thought of having sin in his presence because he is holy and pure and set apart, totally holy from anything of this, the corruption of Satan in this world. 
And so it is a fearful thing to stand the wrath of God, to know that now there is shown to us even a window of grace because of the work of Christ on the cross and the hope that men would receive him. But on that day when all opportunity to receive that work of Christ as your substitutionary work to pay the debt that we could not pay, at that moment where your final answer has been, I will refuse the work of Christ, I will either work my way to heaven or I refuse to believe that there is a God, but there is coming a day where every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and at that day it will be too late to name yourself as one of his own. The Bible says in, in Luke 13 that you'll see Abraham, you'll see Isaac and Jacob, you'll see all the prophets, you'll see all those who have named themselves with the name of Christ, and you'll say, I want to be part of them now. I understand, I believe it all, but it will be a sad day when you yourself are thrust out because he says, you didn't know me on the earth. And I don't know you before my Father. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not. And at that moment, when the umbrella of the protection of the grace of Christ is totally removed, any opportunity of saving grace is rejected. At that moment, the full wrath of God, the full judgment of a just judge who demands that we be righteous, who demands that we be pure and holy and without sin, at that moment, his very disdain for sin that, turned, that caused him to turn his back on his son will cause him to turn his back on you and to pour out his wrath for all of eternity on those who have rejected the holiness of his son as their substitute. What an awesome thought. And I don't mean that in an uplifting, encouraging way, but what a terrifying, terrible thought that grace is readily extended to all who would come and know the righteousness of God as their own freely without any work or cost to ourselves. And yet there are those who will reject it. And the sobering thought that rejecting the infinite grace, greatness of God likewise demands an eternal judgment for a crime so great. There is no hope of being let out of the judgment of God at that point. To realize the infinite holiness of God, He demands us to worship Him. When we reject that, that eternal decision is made that we must bear the eternal consequences in a literal place, prepared that His wrath would be poured out on sin prepared for the very seed of sin for Satan and his angels, not intended for us. And yet, sin must be dealt with. The justice of God requires it. To think that God, justifiably so, he is love, but his holiness, his pureness, his purity will require that he still judge sin fairly. And so... Hell is not an issue of God's love. Hell is an issue of God's purity, His holiness. The issue of love comes into that in the fact that He has extended Christ to save us from hell. And so, we find that as we see the justice of our holy God explained in Scripture, that God's wrath satisfied by Christ on the cross, if we have known this love, we in turn will love. If we understand the depth of His mercy, the things that we just talked about, and certainly can be explained far greater than my mind can comprehend, if you understand the depth of love that He must have for you to willingly sacrifice His, His Son, to come to you when you could never come to Him, and to readily invite wicked sinners to know the righteousness of God, if we know that kind of a love, then the only thought is that we too should love. In verse 16 of 1 John chapter 4, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Again, the whole concept that is played throughout the book of 1 John, that if we are abiding in Christ, he will abide in us, that we abiding in him will show forth the fruit of the nutrient of our spiritual existence that comes from all that He is coming out in us. And so, the very attribute of love that would cause God in His love for us to extend grace and mercy to us will be displayed in the, in the lives of those who are genuine Christians. Mind you, the book of 1 John is a continual test of true Christianity. Not those who are uh, nominal Christians who would say, yes, I, I am a Christian, I believe there is a Christ, but those who know Christ as their Savior. This is the test. 
How then can you say that you are God's child? How can you say that you know Christ as your Savior if the love of Christ is not being demonstrated in your life? Moses concerned himself with others at the sight of God's holiness. In Exodus 34, verse 9, and he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Isaiah 2, when he saw the holiness of God, and he understood as uh, in verse 6, then, then, one of the seraph, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my, thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. The immediate response to understanding the holiness of God, the gravity of his wrath being poured out, and the fact that he is extending his grace, his mercy, to withhold that judgment on us will automatically help us to understand that he loves in a way that I don't naturally love. And so the old man being passed away, all things becoming new, this is an area that will motivate me to know a love for God that is greater than what I knew on my own, but then, too, as Moses immediately pleads for the mercy of God on the children of Israel, and to Isaiah, when God says, who's going to go and tell others of my holiness? Who's going to go and tell others that they should repent of their sin? Immediately, without hesitation, there's no second thought. Isaiah says, I'll go, send me. Here am I, Lord. If we fully comprehend the holiness of God, I submit to you tonight that there would be a whole lot more Christians that would be readily saying, here am I, send me. When I stand before you and I see you that day, now through a glass and darkly, but that day face to face, when I see you then, I want to be able to say, I strove to, to worship you in your holiness. I sacrificed my life because it was a worthy sacrifice. Moses and Isaiah understood it, and immediately they sought out that God's love would be extended, His mercy would be extended to others. How do we do in extending the, the love of God to others? Is this truly an indicator, of a presence in our life that comes from having the Holy Spirit inside us as genuine Christians? But then we understand that perfect love has no fear. In verse 17 it says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. God's holiness, understand, is manifest in his hatred of sin and delight in righteousness, in his separation from those living in sin, and in his making provision for man to become holy in character and in conduct. To know that the wrath of God is waiting to be poured out on all those who reject his holiness, on all those who choose sin over his son, that is a very fearful thing. And yet, the Bible tells us that we can have confidence before the throne of God because in the greatness of our sin, we still find that the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. It is satisfactory for the demands of a holy, just God. And so if we put our confidence in the holiness of Christ to be our holiness, not that we are holy by ourselves, but we have put our total confidence that Christ has paid it all, all to him I owe. That is Joanne saying that there is no plea I have, but that Christ is all that I have. Then the demands of a just God have been met in Christ. And so if we have put our confidence in him, the Bible says we have nothing to fear, but yet that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So for the believer, we don't fear standing before the wrath of God for all of eternity. So the demand, the, the question tonight, the test tonight here in this passage is, do you fear standing before God at that judgment day? Does the afterlife bother you? Do you lose sleep of it? Do you panic in a heartbeat moment wondering if that car doesn't stop at that light, will I go to heaven when I die? Do you find yourself working and doing all these good deeds to try to earn some favor with God? Tonight, if you are putting your confidence in anything other than Christ, it is a fail. 
The Bible tells us tonight that if you have confidence in Christ, you have nothing to fear of the wrath of God. So the test here is, if you fear the wrath of God in any wise, then you tonight have to seriously question in your soul, have I placed my confidence in Christ? If then you have, why doubt the sufficiency? God has said, I am satisfied. So why should we fear his wrath? But then those who fear judgment do not know God's love. In verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If you are tormented by the wrath of God, you have not understood his love. You have not understood, understood the depth of which he has gone to to gain your life. He has reached out to you far beyond whatever anybody would have imagined worth it to reach out to us. And if we have not comprehended that, if we have not grasped that, then we will be afraid of his wrath. So tonight, if you are afraid of the wrath of God, if it torments you, if the thought of eternity in hell bothers you, then tonight the question from Scripture is, is God's love really made perfect in you? Are you abiding in him? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory, will not allow for the torment of eternity in hell. He's paid far too great a price for us to have to worry that he didn't pay enough. So is God's love made perfect in you? Here's the dividing question. Understanding the judgment of God and his love, we love him. The Bible says in verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. How can you look at the holiness of God? How can you see the extent of love that he has for you, the depth that he would go to to reach you, the sacrifice he was willing to make? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend, and that Christ willingly laid down his life for you. He saw you as worth it. How can you look at the holiness of God that demands justice be poured out in judgment on sin? Realize his love withheld that wrath from you and not be in love with God. How can that not grip your heart and draw you to him? We love him because he first loved us. Oh, that God would give us a greater understanding of his love, that we would love him more. The division is, do you love God? Is his love made perfect in you? If we do not demonstrate his love, we know not his love, only his judgment. Look at verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is the commandment we have in him that he who loveth God love his brother also. Very simply, how can you pretend to say that you are a Christian? How can you say that you know the love of God? And yet, the Bible makes it very clear here in 1 John 4 that if we are God's child, if we are saved by the blood of Christ, then he abides in us. And when he abides in us, his fruit, his likeness will come out in us. And so, understanding the love that he has for those around you was so great, he died for them too. So how can we say then that we are truly Christian? How can we say then that we have the love of God working in us if we don't display such sacrificial love for those around us? That's a tough thought to swallow. To realize that God expects of me that I show the same extent of his love to others that he has shown to me. The patience that he has towards me. The long suffering, the forbearance that he has shown me. The mercy that he has allowed me to fall and rise again. That while I should have readily been cut off from the face of the earth, that my name should never be spoken for all of eternity for the wickedness of my heart, why should it be brought before God? And yet his love has allowed that my name would be written on his hands. That my name will be found in the book of life because he loved me that much. 
So then, it should be no obstacle that we would love our neighbors as God loves us. That we would show good works to them, not that they would say, wow, what a neighbor, but that they would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Our love for others ought to increase dramatically. It is a sad day that we as a church would have a reputation as being fighters, that there would be bickering named among us, that the world would look at us and say, they're just such angry people. Why would I want to be a part of that? How can that be true? If God is love, why are, he, why are his children such angry, hard-nosed people? Because the Bible says that if you're my child, then I abide in you, which means my love abides in you. And your love ought to be demonstrated to others as a reflection of my love for you. Does the wrath of God torment you? Then I beg the question, do you know Christ as your Savior? Not knowing that he did all the work to be your Savior, but knowing that you have consciously made the decision to ask him to be your Savior. If you have, does the love for others in your heart reflect that Christ is abiding in you and his love is pouring out from you? We do not well to be stingy, angry Christians. Ours is the responsibility to demonstrate the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, to show that he abides in us and that his love would be poured out on others through us. Mind you, as it says just in the verses before what we looked at tonight, that what people know of God may be exclusively what they see of him through you. How do we do as Christians demonstrating his love? That we would glimpse his holiness and that it would give us a far greater appreciation of his love for us tonight and that we would do our due diligence to pour out that love on others, that they would know it as well. With our hearts and heads bowed before the Lord tonight, would there be any here to